Okay, folks, welcome back to the channel. Donnie D back at you. So today I'm doing another review on a video and this one has millions upon millions of views and is made by some some kind of woodworking guy, DIY special guy on and, and, uh, YouTube here. It's crazy that some people just, they, they make these videos that are, you know, high production editing and uh, good quality video and they, and they blow up. So I'm going to kind of go over everything, see what I see that's done well, see what I see has not done so well, and uh, kind of go through the video and go from there. So stay tuned. Here we go. But I decided to split them up because there's just so much information, I think, especially for people who are new to tile. I did a ton of research. I still made plenty of mistakes, and I really tried to tailor the information in this video. Okay, let me stop them there. Yeah, there is plenty of video, uh, plenty of information online, especially on YouTube and Google, which, you know, if you know, Google owns YouTube, and there's a lot of, there's probably more misinformation out there now than there ever was. I mean, there's only so many guys, probably a handful of guys I could say on YouTube that I know of that does, you know, tile work that's done correctly. And the rest is just incorrect. So I'll agree with them there. There's, you know, you gotta, you gotta be, you gotta really vet where you're getting your information from. I mean, there's so much information as, you know, as we know, I mean, it's 2021 now, you know, 15 years ago we had, you know, the, uh, the internet, but the information was nowhere near like it is now. Just things have changed dramatically. The best tool I've found to remove some of the. Okay, now looks like he's removing staples. But these staples were not your typical carpet pad staples. These were over an inch long, narrow crown staples like cabinet shops use for drawer box assembly. The best tool I found for removing these things was a pair of diagonal pliers and they were able to grip onto the heads of the staples and then I could just use leverage to pry the staples out. Yeah, I totally agree with them there. That's how I do. When you come across your staples, a lot of guys will just whack them down with a hammer because it's easier, faster, but they still stick up a little bit. And you know, you're going to be going over this with mortar, so any little holes are going to get filled in with mortar. Everything's going to be rock solid, so I agree with them totally here. You know, there's going to be a tremendous amount of staples. I've come across this many times, and you got many layers of flooring with lamb and everything is stapled down with Luan, multiple different underlayments. You're best off removing the staples, going from there. Don't whack them in, remove them. If there's stick, nails sticking up there in the joists, obviously you whack them down. But any staples holding into the subfloor, remove them, definitely. If I tried to just brute force the staples with vice grips, I ended up working a heck of a lot harder. I also might have been able to found the staples flush with a hammer, but I knew I was going to have to sand down some. Okay, so what he's using here is Ditra, which is really good, but you got to make sure that your substrate is, you know, if you have 60 on center joisting, what's most single family homes are, you can have a minimum of 5 8 tongue and groove plywood, and that's approved for most uncoupling membranes, including what he has here, which is Fluter Ditra. Uh, if you have 24 on center joist and you want to put at least a half inch thick underlayment plywood down before this and then go from there but it looks like he's all right i don't know if that's the case with his subfloor he didn't really go over anything with his joist structure so hopefully everything is all right and the purpose of this product is to uncouple your tile from the subfloor which allows the subfloor whether that's concrete or wood to expand and contract while allowing the tile to stay put which reduces crack large format tile from the mohawk for all right so it looks like he's got hole by 24 tile let's see exactly the specs forever style line from lowe's and this tile is waterproof stain proof and scratch resistant so it's great okay let me say it well Word doesn't affect tile. Okay, so now it looks like he's doing his layout. Let's see what he's got. The tile was to figure out how much I was going to need to rip off the first row of tile. And as it turned out, these tiles fit almost perfectly in the space. So I added the tiles with a 3 16th inch spacer, which is the gap I was leaving for the grout. Now it looks like this tile is, is a calibrated tile. So yeah, your minimum grout joint would be 3 16 So he is correct there temporarily so that I could mark out the center point of the room as well as the offset. 
and it does look like his joists over here are 16 on center so he should be fine as long as his plywood is at least 5 8 if not even better 3 quarters. I was going with. And on a larger room you would mark these lines with a chalk line and also install your tile from the center of the room but honestly on a room this small it was easier to just mark my lines with permanent marker and install them starting in the back of the room. Also on large format tile like this you don't want an offset greater than 33 percent otherwise. Okay yeah exactly he's correct there. On um, most tile that's any tile that's over 15 inches 15 inches or bigger is considered a large format tile so yes you don't want it more than 33 percent offset because then you can have a low spot and a high spot and vice versa so I try to aim for about 25 percent um, but 33 is the max you want to go so yes that's correct I shall end up with more lippage and that means your typical brick pattern so it looks like what he's doing here is going to dry fit the whole floor on the plywood, pre-cut everything, and then put the Dietra down. That, that's fine. I don't see a problem with that. Just a lot of lifting and putting back. I wouldn't probably do this. I'll probably put the Dietra down, and then just dry fit everything, and then pull it off and set it. So that way you don't kind of lose things around, you know, because <laughs> you have to stack this towel somewhere. You might make a mistake and put, you know, the cut the wrong way or lay it out the wrong way, so... Beach her down first and then dry fit the towel if you want to. With a 50% offset will not really work with large format tile. Yes, I went with a 6 inch offset which worked out to about 25%. Okay, I don't know if he's sponsored by Lowe's but it, it, it might, he must be sponsored by Lowe's for this video because everything he's got is from Lowe's and will pay everything. So it looks like he's using over here is just your latex additive. Um, to get a really, really good polymer modified mortar. The Dietra to the plywood, you always want a modified mortar. It just has to be ANSI 10, I believe it just has to be ANSI 118.4, which is an EGP mortar or higher. Uh, I'll put that in the uh, description what exactly you want it to have at minimum, but about it right so far. Okay, yeah, so he's using my pay and coupling membrane more, which is unmodified, made for, you know, Dietrich as they call for unmodified or their mortar. So he's using that latex to make this a modified. Two gallon container, and then I use this uncoupling membrane mortar, which again called for the entire bag to be. Now I see all this dust right here. That's why, you know, being a pro, this is all silica. You do not want to be breathing this stuff in. Now you want to use your whale towel. There's plenty of different products on the market, but basically hook up your vacuum to that and it sucks the dust away. No or less exposure to the to breathing in the silica. Uh, I mean, I did it like this for, for years. I would definitely put my shirt over my face, but you really want to try to avoid breathing this stuff because you can have lung problems if you do this all the time. Over time, or maybe you just do it once hour problem. You never know, but you really want to not breathe in this stuff, so that's the main thing. Be used. And this made the mixing mass really easy. So, see what he's doing right here? That is way too much mortar in the bucket. So he's going to have a problem when he's mixing this. You really want to mix, put, the amount you want to usually put in buckets is to about right here. Okay, because that way you have room to get the mixer in there. It's not going to fly out everywhere. So he's definitely not experienced with this. This is definitely <clears throat> DIY unexperienced, you know, person doing this. Easy, but also meant I had a very full bucket. And that first stir with the paddle made a bit of a mess. See, making a mess. Anyway, I mixed this inset for a few minutes, making sure everything. Okay, so if you guys can see, he's using a Corelish drill to mix this mortar. So, yes, you can do that. You can mix a small portion, maybe about to about here in the bucket, and it might get it done. Mixing this amount with a cordless drill is asking for a problem. First of all, the drill doesn't have enough power. Number two, you're probably going to burn out. And you're going to have to add a lot of water to even be able to mix the mortar because it's going to have a really hard time, you know, mixing it. What you want to use is something that has a high torque. Uh, Rigid makes a mud mixer. I use a mixer made by Column Mix. Uh, it's made for the thing costs $600, but it has a lot of power. It's made to have a lot of torque to mix more like this. Using a cordless drill will work if you're just doing this, you know, one time thing, but just mix it in small portions. So it's one thing to point out there. 
Okay, so he's following the directions with letting it sleek. That's important. Not everyone does that. Minutes for applying the thin set, I wipe down my subfloor with a damp sponge, and this both cleans any remaining dust off of the subfloor, but also wets it slightly. Okay, so he he's correct with that. You just wanna get a clean sponge, some clean water, wring it out good, and just wipe down it. Make sure you get any dust. But if you guys can see here, see all this white. When they built this house, this is from the painters, their overspray they got on the floor. This is not good. This is actually a, it can be a bomb breaker. Now, not that it will fail, but you're bonding to the paint. And if that's not bonded perfectly to the floor, it's not good. So either way, I wouldn't leave this down. I would take my cup grinder with a, with a vacuum attachment and you want to grind all this paint off of here. Any bomb breakers, you want to bond directly to this plywood. So what he's doing here, could be a problem in the future and uh, the one number one failures of uncoupler membranes believe it or not is a bond failure so bonding that membrane to the floor and having it stay there is is crucial just to ensure the subfloor doesn't suck up too much moisture out of the thin set and you might be thinking but what about the uncoupling membrane i thought we couldn't attach the tile directly to the subfloor and that is correct. This first layer of thin set is to adhere the membrane itself to the subfloor. Okay, so it looks like he's using your one of, one of your cheap, you know, disposable type trowels that'll work. And he is keying in the substrate, and he's definitely in DIY, just the, his, how his mechanics are and all that. He's not a pro. He's giving out pretty decent information, but he's not skilled in this. Definitely not. Um, he is keying it in, so he's following the you know procedure. No worries there. Or not the tile. And as you can see, as I laid the thin set, I really tried to work it into the substrate. Yes, he's correct. You don't want, when you take the key in your, your substrate, no matter what it is, wall, floor, ceiling, tile, whatever, you want to, you don't want to just float over the surface with a bunch of more. You want to press it down, push it into the surface good. Think about like a tree, cheese grater. If you're just going to kind of float over it, you know, the mortar would just droop in here a little bit, but if you, you get some more and you press it down hard it's really going to force it down in between it just think of the pores of the plywood you want to press it down in there well all right see what he's doing here he's got way too much on the floor and he's reaching over so if you're a diy person watching this you want to do it where you can reach okay let's say he stopped halfway here key this section in and then notch it and then key this section in over here and then notch that you don't want to be reaching over after a day's work your back's going to be gone on your knees so try not to kill yourself work smart with the thin set in place I'm okay this is all bad here see all this spot here that's a void 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 there's no ridges here see that has to be even better ridges like he has going down here and over here you don't want any, this is just not enough mortar here. So that's over here, he's missing some back over here. So that's gonna not have the coverage that it needs on, on the detour here. So that is not good right there. Void, 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 big void here, not good. I could add the first piece of the membrane. I laid it in place and then worked the membrane into the thin set with a rubber grout float. Using a float, that works fine. I like to use a mud float, which is just a piece of a handle with a piece of wood on it. You can use a two by four. I like the wood because it doesn't grab the detra too much. If you use a grout float, that will kind of grab it, making it hard to move around. So a piece of wood or a mud wood float, that's what I find works the best. And the coverage was, and I could see that I had some bare spots around the edges, especially. Oh Jesus, see this? Yeah, he's seen that that he's got some voids, but I believe that his thin set is just a little bit too stiff over here as well. So, see these lines here? You really want to have them collapse. You want to kind of like this section here. You want you really want it to look like an English muffin. So having the mortar at the proper consistency is, is very important. Okay, because you can see when you press in this edge over here, it was kind of raising. If this if this is really sticking well, it would stay down. It wouldn't wouldn't come up at all. So. Coverage on these membranes is so important, it's not funny. So, using a high quality thin set. Bare spots around the edges especially. So I went back and added more thin set and then just repeated that same process. And you can see that the front edge was peeling back when I didn't have enough thin set, but stayed flat once I added more. After finish. Yeah, I wonder what it looks like when you retrial it, uh, what the coverage is. So you always wanna check. 
If you're not getting good coverage the first time, retrial it, push it in, but then check it again and see. And if it's still not good, more than likely, there's not enough thin set on the surface, it's not troweled correctly, or the mortar's too stiff. Now you can see over here, <clears throat> see the thin set? It looks like a matte finish. It's kind of, it's we call that on the stiff side, the term we use in, in, in the, uh, when you're being, you know, a towel set, we say it's, it's stiff. We say we want it loose, we want it stiff. Now when you're doing membranes, you want it loose. Now you know when you have your mortar loose, when it has a shine to it, this one does not have a shine. You want to have a shine, kind of like a gloss finish to it, and that means there's more than enough water into it. When you get your, your uh, trowel lifted up, it should drop off slow. Not like liquid, but drop off slow. And when it's too stiff, it'll just stay right on the trowel. It won't even move. So, mortar consistency is key. Yes, yeah, so he's trawling in the right direction. His ridges look decent for the wire, and he's going one direction. So, that looks good. Only issue I see is that he has no nothing to stay straight off of. I believe he's going by the molding, but most walls aren't straight. So I'll either have a snap, a, a chalk line somewhere here, or a straight edge. That way you start off nice and straight and everything goes off of that. When spreading the thin set, I would only work in sections that I could get tile onto within about 15 minutes. He's correct. You, want, you really want to spread it enough that you could cover really in about 10 minutes. Uh, you know, Job site conditions, how much water is in the mix, really will vary how long it's going to, before it skins over, but most will skin over anywhere between 20 minutes and 10 minutes. But if you're back buttering a towel, keying the back, it, it, let's say it did skin, it'll, you know, the, the fresh more will bond to the skin more and you still have a good bond there. You don't want to wait that long if you don't have to. But, you know, covering the mortar sooner than later is very good and then make your adjustments afterwards as I didn't want the thin set setting up before I could get the tile all set in place. See, I don't know if he's actually back buttering these or not. So one other thing I probably should have done. All right, so you just said that he didn't, he should have back buttered. And always, with any size tile, back buttering, it gives you a little bit more coverage, but it's really not about the coverage, it's the transfer of the mortar to the mortar, okay? Like that, okay? It just it's gonna bond that much better together. Was what's called back buttering, where you spread a thin layer of thin set on the back of the tile before placing it. And this is especially important on large format tiles so that you get even coverage, and it's something I honestly just completely forgot to do. He's correct. It's important to get a good coverage on any size tile. That's what's gonna make or break your install. So as I mentioned earlier, I didn't quite undercut that door jam and trim enough and this made sliding the tiles into place under the trim extremely difficult. And the left side went in okay, but the right... Yeah, so you can take off the trim and then put it back on, recut it. Um, if it's on there, it's painted. Yeah, you're better off just undercutting. The, he did not cut the trim short enough. So the, the way I actually go about it, I should make actually a video on how I do it, is I just take a scrap piece of tile. I take three sixteenths horseshoe spacers and that's what I'm doing a tile like this this size with using this size notch okay so a scrap piece of tile three sixteenths horseshoe spacers okay make sure the tile is sitting flat use about four spacers or so and then that's my gauge for my mortar take my oscillator and cut it now once you get all that done as you're setting it I will clean up this row right here measure the height of the tile and then measure that to the trim, making sure that it's going to fit under there. If you have to trim, it's better to do it now. Then once you get mortar everywhere, it's just going to make a mess. Right side just wouldn't go all the way in without some assistance. And I had the bright idea. And yeah, when you when you slide these in, the best way he should have done it would have been to set this tile and then these over here because to get this in can be difficult. You see how far he had to slide that. You're basically removing all the more. This tile is probably sitting lower than these. It's probably got a lip there. You had to use a hammer using some of the Detraz padding, and surprise, surprise, I ended up cracking it. Yeah, he tried to force it in there. When you try to force something, it doesn't work. So when you're putting these pieces in, you have to put this one on an angle to get in here. You want the room, so you really don't want this tile that's here. So what you could do, when you, before you start setting these tiles, put this tile in here, mark a line, you know, spread your mortar, put that in, and make sure it's right where you want to be, and then set these ones here. Now, when you set this one, make sure there's more than enough mortar 
and don't push it down too much yet okay S set this one set this one set these and this is the height that you want to be at okay so this tile is high fine you could push it down if it's low then you have to lift these and then you have to lift these to get it in okay so you really want to set this one first make sure there's more than enough mortar proper size ridges don't push it down too hard install these make sure that the height's right and then you're good to go replace that last tile see this this is like no un these are collapsed ridges here over here is missing more and this more looks like it's a little bit stiff from the picture but you know having these ridges looking like this one right here all over here that's how you're gonna get the coverage it's got to be you got to hold your trial at a 45 degree angle and make sure you have your ridges standing proud with no collapsing no voids nothing like that it's important in place by the thin set once the strip was in place, I could lay the last tile, also refreshing that thin set. And you can see that there was a little bit of lippage between that tile below the trim and the center tile. And this was again because the trim was pushing down on the tile, causing it to lift slightly. And I didn't feel like there was much I could do at this point, so I just left it alone. After setting that last tile and <laughs> breathing a sigh of relief, I cleaned up any excess thin set from the subfloor between the tile. So he's got a pretty good amount of lippage here. Let me rewind that. See, this is why I was saying you got to make sure you cut this jam more than enough. Okay, dry fit this one. Measure off of these if these are already set, and see that if it's if it's going to fit under here. This is the last thing you want. You you don't want these setting these setting these and then putting this one here and then it's too high. Okay, not good. So setting those jam pieces, they have to slide under making sure there's enough mortar and it's actually higher than the surrounding tiles so you can always push it down you really can't lift it up as well as a putty knife for any bits between yeah you can just use a doodle pad we call it. it's like it's like a abrasive pad a damp sponge to clean up any excess grout if you have to use your utility knife to clean out the joints just be real careful and as long as you do this the next day let's say you got done setting at 4 p.m it's 8 9 o'clock the next day you're starting cleaning it that's good. The mortar still will be slightly soft. Now, if you wait 24 hours, 48 hours, it's going to start getting real hard and very difficult to clean the joint. So it's always a good idea to clean them the next day. Don't let it sit too long. Like if I'm doing a, a bathroom, it's a Friday. I'll try to come back the next day on a Saturday if, if it's if it's a little bit messy. Unless I get a gin clean, I'll leave it till Monday. But if it's a little bit messy, I'll try to come there on a Saturday morning, clean it up. So I don't want to let it sit in there too long. It'll be real hard to, and difficult to wait those few days and clean it afterwards. The tiles. The next step in the tile process was grouting, which really gives the tile a finished look. Okay, so you're using a Pay Flex Color CQ. This is like a urethane. I, I just call a caulk in a bucket. I don't recommend these grouts. I've had bad experiences with them, and you can look up online as well. I would not recommend them. People always worry about the grout being sealed. Most premium cement based grouts these days have a sealer in it and they're going to be stain resistant. Every grout's going to stain unless there's epoxy and that, that's pretty much stain proof. But every other one, if you let something sit on there like five minutes, it's going to stain. I mean, it's cement, it's porous, it's going to stain. That was a pretty simple process. First, I wiped down a section with a damp sponge to make sure no other debris was on the surface of the tile. That's a good idea. And then I started working the grout into the seams between the tiles. And you really want to work the grout in to make sure the joints are completely filled with grout. Otherwise, it might end up settling as it dries. And yes, he's correct. You want to make sure you pack the joints well. Okay, because it's going to go down and under the tile, if there's any voids, pack them good so everything is filled and supported. It's very important. Leaving you with voids. After working the grout into the joints, I scraped across the tile at a 45 degree angle from the grout lines to remove the excess grout. That's correct. I pack all the joints and go across with a 45 line at a 90 degree with your grout flow and clean off the excess. After scraping off the excess, I gave the grout five to 10 minutes to set up before cleaning the rest off with a sponge. And I actually grouted about three fourths of the entire floor before going back with the sponge. And I think this ended up being a little bit too long as the grout was kind of difficult to remove. I see I was holding a grout, the uh, grout sponge here. <laughs> 
it's kind of holding at 45. You never want to hold your sponge like that because what he's going to do is as it comes across the joint, it's going to hit it and it's going to pull out the grout there. Keep your sponge flat so you're basically floating over the surface, keeping those joints as full as possible. Now he was saying that he waited too long. Now with this CQ, I'm not experienced with this one, but I've used other urethane, you know, base caulk, I call them caulk in a bucket type grouts. And yeah, you want to do small section and clean up right away. But once again, I don't recommend it. If you're going to use a grout that you don't want to stain ever, use epoxy. Otherwise, use your premium grade cement based grout and you'll be just fine. Move with the sponge. In retrospect, I probably would have only done about half the floor at a time. Once again, when we're and again, see how he's holding a sponge? You gotta keep it flat with the surface. This is all wrong. The grout with the sponge, I wiped across the face of the tile at a 45 degree angle to the grout lines, and I didn't really need to use a ton of pressure here. Also, my sponge was damp, but not dripping wet, and if you add too much water, it'll have the tendency to lift the color from the grout. That's correct. You don't want your sponge dripping. You wanna squeeze it out, squeeze. You wanna squeeze out the sponge good, so just so it's damp, that's it. You're just trying to get the excess grout off the surface. I just continued working my way around the floor, removing the excess grout, and also added the grout to the last section, as well as in the gap the transition strip has built in, and then I could let the grout set up for another 24 hours. As I mentioned, I think I let the grout set up for a little bit too long before wiping it off, so I was left with some bits of excess grout on the surface of the tiles, along with a little bit of haze, and I think this is pretty typical. To remove the haze, I... Well, you can get haze on the surface, but you really want to avoid that. And I'll put a link in the description, maybe a card up here, about how I do my grout product jobs from start to finish. How you can get it haze-free, clean grout job. So since he has these problems, yeah, you're gonna want. You're probably gonna have to use it. You know, and some kind of product to remove the haze now if this is with a, the next day you might just be all right using the method i have like like i showed in the video um you just you could just use uh <coughs> microfiber some water some distilled vinegar mixed together and that will just take it off if not you might have to use one of these products like this okay guys so that's that video like i was saying this guy gave pretty decent information for the most part. He's going by the book, but his techniques, his skill level is just not there. I wouldn't go by everything he said. Like I point out the things I agree with, the things I didn't agree with. But that's what I got for this video, guys. I'm going to probably try to do these type of videos in the future. So if you have another tile type channel that you like me to review on one of their videos, let me know. Put it in the comment section below. Otherwise, we'll see you on the next video. Donnie D, signing off.